So for me, it's a great honor to get to introduce Taylor Branch, because for me, he's someone who understands this connection, who's written very persuasively about the connection between democracy and gambling, and the ways in which gambling undermines our democracy. He's someone who uh, personally has been very inspired by his books, uh, have been very inspirational for me. Um, in a couple of days, two days, he's receiving the Dayton Literary Peace Prize uh, for 2008. <laughs> That's Turkle. We're very pleased about that. Uh, he's, um, he's someone who many of you know. He's written sort of the definitive work on Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he's written this, the trilogy, uh, America and the King Years, uh, and is especially known for the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, Parting the Waters. Uh, my own city paper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, called that book endlessly instructive and fascinating, thorough and stupendous, now the source and standard in its field. The Inquirer doesn't give out praise all that easily, as we know, so it's always great to take it when you got it. Uh, he lives in Maryland here uh, with his wife, uh, Christina, uh, and his two children, Macy and Franklin. Been very, very active in the Maryland struggle here, and someone who's been very solid in his support. Um, and I'll just add one other thing that uh, the action that Les mentioned, this uh, Freedom Players, action up in Oregon, a uh, number of us, uh, including Chad and others who are, who are here, uh, were involved with where we went into a casino to practice what it would look like to shut it down. Freedom playing, we call it, in the, in the form of what a, what a slot parlor really should be about. It's really about entertainment. People should be entertained. So we decided we'd go to the slot parlor and entertain ourselves, <laughs> uh, which included getting to read um, Taylor Branch's Party of Waters. <laughs> been read many places, but I imagine this is the first time you've ever heard of Party Waters being read uh, at a slot machine. <laughs> so, without further ado, I'm honored to get to bring up Taylor Branch. Well, I am honored to be here. That was, I've never heard of any of my books read in a slot machine. <laughs> oh, and, and I love your stories, and uh, particularly the fact that you mentioned uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, over 40 years ago, uh, when I was 21, I met Fannie Lou at the Chicago Convention in, in uh, the Democratic Party, which is the one when the tear gas came out and the riots and all that, and I was a gopher up there for Julian Bond as a college student. And I had an assignment for one hour, which was to make sure that Fannie Lou Hamer did not move from a spot right at, right at, the, uh, at the entrance to the podium. You could see uh, the great chasm out there. And it was because there was an elaborate scheme uh, introduced in play to have Ted Kennedy, um, the emergency nominee of the Democratic Party, after Humphrey had won, and this was a combination of the various anti-war people and the civil rights folks, Fannie Lou had been seated there with the Mississippi Freedom Democrats. Um, I was there from Georgia because we were imitating the Mississippi Freedom Democrats, challenging our governor, Lester Maddox, who appointed the entire delegation um, from Georgia in 1968. They were all male, they were all white, and they were all supporters of the Vietnam War. And so we got a whole coalition of people to try to challenge that. Our goal was to uh, uh, position ourselves like the Mississippi Freedom Democrats, maybe to be seated and to reform the Democratic Party four years later. Much to our surprise, they seated us on the spot, um, which meant that I, as the logistics coordinator, had to find the money to bring 70 people up from Georgia and find hotel rooms in Chicago. Um, but when we finally got into the convention, there's this subterfuge, and everybody is talking about whether this is going to be possible or not. And there were, if so, if Ted Kennedy agreed to do it, then, then uh, Mississippi, some state was going to yield to Mississippi for the purpose of uh, placing a surprise nomination, and Fannie Lou was going to go out there and nominate. Him. And I'm sitting there talking to her. She was, she was about this high, uh, and very round. Um, <laughs> And she had nothing there. And I said, well, what are you going to say if you walk out? This is a historic moment. Um, 
She says, I don't know, the Lord will tell me something. She said, this is the way I've been doing it all my life, and I don't know whether they'll let me do it or not, but I know it's a good thing because it feels right. So anyway, we talked for about an hour, and then finally word came that, uh, that Ted Kennedy's family was too afraid that a third Kennedy would be assassinated, and they'd already lost two within the last five years, and it was a chaotic political situation anyway, and may not have worked, so we backed out, and I got to escort Fannie Lou Hamer back to the Mississippi Freedom Democrat section at 21. I rarely get to... Um, recall that, but it was an amazing beginning for me in what citizenship meant, because here's a woman who, who couldn't read and learned how to read and write, and then how to teach other people how to read and write only a couple of years earlier. And now she's up there literally about to go out and influence the history of the United States by possibly placing a new name and nomination and sitting there talking about citizenship as something that came from the heart, something that was um, the ultimate responsibility. I, uh, <clears throat> I came as a white southerner in Georgia into obsession with citizenship through my stupefaction as a child with the courage of the civil rights movement, which converted me against my will and changed the whole direction of my life's interests against my will because during my formative years, uh, it was just happening all around me. I spent 24 years writing the, the uh, trilogy later on, and the longer I worked on it, the more I was convinced that it came together at a, at a fusion of roots between religion and democracy, self-government and public trust, at a very deep level, uh, that ultimately benefited not only the United States and people of every stripe, uh, race, gender, the disabled, People are still being benefited today by the witness that was set in motion then over what equal citizenship means when people take democracy and equal citizenship and equal souls, which is the religious side of it, uh, seriously. It goes all around the world. And we, sadly, are numb in the, at the genesis spot for all this new freedom to our own example, which has gone all around the world, to Nelson Mandela, to Tiananmen Square, to China, to the Berlin Wall, where they were singing, we shall overcome, without a shot fired, when communism dissolved. There's tremendous inspiration. It's like nuclear energy. Within the concepts of citizenship, if you take it seriously, that, to me, is the great lesson uh, from studying people immersed in the freedom movement. Now, to me, a, what a movement does is a discovery of a larger interest and of things that you have in common with people that you didn't know. That's what a movement is. It starts as a small inspiration. I am moved. I am, but it grows because by the time, for example, the movement people who had tried three times to march from Selma to Montgomery and a whole, whole bunch of people, clergy and others, were murdered along the way. By the time they finally got to Montgomery, there were journalists from 165 countries there, and you could literally feel history changing. So when people take a leap into the unknown about what citizenship is and discover that people from different kinds and different stripes and different walks of life are asking the same questions, there is that is what a movement is, and that's when it grows. And I salute you for doing that, for recognizing that this issue is not about liberal and conservative. It's not about um, it's not about black and white. It's not about one kind of government versus another. It's about citizenship at its most fundamental. That's why I, 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 I salute Tom Gray. You guys have been in it for a long time, and. Uh, and in many respects, I think you are um, you're fighting not only the same battles that Dr. King was fighting about what citizenship means, but you're fighting the same battles that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were fighting. When democracy was born in the United States, it was ridiculed and considered impossible. It is hard. 
It was a, considered a philosophical problem. Madison wrote all over the world for tracts on why every previous republic had failed. It was, he, could, he called it the greatest meditation on human nature, is free government. And he finally, in designing the Constitution, said he came up with two fundamental principles that made it so radical. One is the notion that people can govern themselves. And he said, summon every votary of freedom to rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. That was a new and a preposterous idea to most people. And the other part was public trust, that we can trust one another to build something bigger than any of us could handle on our own farm. Which is why he said, without virtue in the people, there is no form of government that will protect liberty. You have to trust people. You have to trust that marginal voter. That's why we believe in votes and elections rather than arms and fights and intrigue and conspiracies. But that sets the standard that is still there. Slot machines, predatory gamblers, it all comes from intrigue, conspiracy, and subterfuge. It's born in larceny, aimed at suckers, and has to subvert democracy democracy to succeed and ultimately depends on the indifference or the cynicism of the great middle mass of voters who do not take democracy seriously and who do not recognize that the conditions for Madison, that is that democracy is hard and a philosophical challenge to every citizen, are still here. It's still hard. We just take it for granted and that's why we run into situations like we are with our bailout. Our country is in crisis, realizing that politics is really serious, and it affects people's lives, and there are consequences when you believe there's free lunch, and you borrow money for trillions of dollars, and you say, we don't need to worry about democracy because we've got that figured out, it's the big D on our flag. And our patriotism is simple and emotional. No, patriotism is the self-responsibility of every citizen. Freedom is not free. It requires thought. It requires discipline. It requires accountability and openness. None of those is present in predatory state-sponsored gambling. It violates the first principle. <laughs> the first principle of what Madison and Jefferson and the founders were trying to accomplish was to build a compact of citizens for the public trust. And the very first rule of that is that you don't play your fellow citizens for suckers. And that's what predatory gambling does. Rather than open accountability, we have, we have a patriotic duty. You can argue, you can yell, you can account, you can vote. But you, when you do that, even in disagreement, you're forging bonds of accountability to one another. State-sponsored gambling is basically saying we want to sever all those behind a con artist's game that, and put all the money in a big, under a magician's handkerchief and say, okay, this is the only place you school teachers are going to get any. Get under there, under the handkerchief, and scrum with the casino parlor owners, the gambling machine owners in Maryland, the horse track owners, the lobbyists and everybody else, and come up with what you can. And that's the only way you're going to get any money. That's, that is a laughable formula for how citizenship should work. And surely, the lessons now of all of these instruments of borrowing and free money and of debt in the public sphere coming home, possibly to calamity for our whole country, should be the wake-up call we all need whether we're ministers concerned about honest souls or social liberals concerned about the exploitation of the poor, to recognize that citizenship is serious. It begins with open, honest accountability, public trust, and a movement. And on no, on, from no political point of view on earth do you advance democracy through predatory state-sponsored gambling that tells us we're not all in this together. We're divided up between the people who are in the know and the people who are looking the other way while their pockets being 
being picked and the people who are sadly staring in the screens at, at, at the least informed kind of gambling in the world in the slot machine pouring money in there. Nobody, well, I'm, in, I'm from Maryland, I, I will have to say, I have never found anybody in Maryland who supports the, the referendum that's upcoming to establish slot machines who, is, who thinks that they're doing it as a more efficient way of paying their share of taxes. The secret truth is that they're all doing it so that somebody else will pay the taxes. And that somebody, and they don't care who it is, and that is part of the magician's cloak. They don't, but that is the cynicism that has gotten us into trouble. And it is no accident, accident as a historian for me to say that the period when we have gotten caught up in cynicism, it's roughly 40 years, is and, and caught up in debt, national and otherwise, coincides exactly with the period that state-sponsored gambling has spread across the United States. The first lottery was established in 1964 in New Hampshire in the 20th century. They had two drawings a year. You had to register in triplet and go to the bank. They said it would only help school children. This is, this is a common pattern. It is predatory. Once you step through that door, and once you step through that door of saying citizenship is for somebody else to worry about, and there's free lunch, and we can borrow it, you're going to come to grief sooner or later. The total national debt of the United States in 19, uh, at the end of the 1970s was uh, about half a trillion dollars, accumulated over the course of 180 years, or, or 200 years. It's gone, it, it went up tenfold in the next ten years to roughly four trillion dollars when the first President Bush came into office. And it's now eleven trillion, so it's almost tripled in the last fifteen years. In the last eight years alone, thirty-two million babies have been born. The national Debt has grown by nearly $5 trillion, which works out to about $125,000 of debt to be serviced on top of the rest of the debt for those people. It's all on free month money. That's the kind of thinking on a national scale that the states are duplicating on the state scale through state-sponsored gambling, and it undermines the very democracy, which is our most precious inheritance. So I think that hard-shell Baptist evangelicals and heirs of Martin Luther King and descendants of James Madison's slaves, uh, all of us, and, and flint-hearted bankers from the school of Alexander Hamilton, have, all have something in common if they're honest about our inheritance of freedom which is that freedom requires self-government, openness, accountability, public trust, none of which is compatible with this state-sponsored gambling. So when you tell the story, tell the story from every different direction, that we're standing up to be citizens, we're standing up to restore and our, our government, our heritage, and to understand that freedom is not free, but when you pay its price, it unites us all. So I salute you in your cause in whatever state you're, you're in, and um, I wish you well. And, uh, and this, this truly is the, the air, the air apparent cause that is, that is consequential and tangent to the very efforts to restore our, our, our national government which I think is an, is an urgent task. So wake up, our, help wake up our citizens and recognize that you stand shoulder to shoulder with people from every era and every stripe and walk of life who understand that freedom is a deep intellectual and spiritual quest for every one of us. Thank you very much.